Hi everyone. My name is Aisha Mian. I am the Patient Programs Coordinator with Crohn's and Colitis Canada. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to moderate today's webinar and to learn more about our guest speakers, Dr. Gail Kaplan and Ellen Kuzeg. I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to the webinar and then outlining today's agenda. So today's education webinar on tests, tests, and more tests, surviving school and the doctor's office, hosted by Crohn's and Colitis Canada, is made possible through an educational grant from AbbVie. For those of you new to webinars, I'll quickly run through how you can ask questions and how they will be answered. So right now, all of you participants are automatically muted so that everyone can hear the speakers and we can capture this webinar recording without any audience um, interference. If you would like to ask a question at any point during the webinar, simply look at the right side of your screen in the middle and you should see a field that says questions. You can ask questions of speakers by typing into this chat box. When you ask a question, even if the question, even if the speaker is still talking, we will make note of it and we'll present all the questions at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to type out any questions you have and I will read as many as I can um, for the Q&A portion of our webinar. If we don't get to your question, please feel free to follow up with us at info at ibdscholarship.ca. If you have any technical questions, you can also type it into this box and we will follow up with you directly. If you're having trouble hearing the speakers, it may be because of your computer's audio settings. Try calling into the phone number provided using a mobile phone or a landline. Great, so we're ready to get started. So before we get into the presentations, I'll give you a little bit of background on Crohn's and Colitis Canada. So as I said, my name is Aisha Mian, and I am the Patient Programs Coordinator at Crohn's and Colitis Canada's National Office. Crohn's and Colitis Canada, formerly known as Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Canada, CCFC for short, was established in 1974 by a group of concerned parents of children with Crohn's disease, disease and ulcerative colitis. We are a national charity dedicated to finding treatments and cures for Crohn's and colitis and to educate people with these diseases as well as the public. We want the general public to be aware of these often debilitating chronic diseases and the toll it takes on nearly a quarter of a million Canadians living with Crohn's and colitis. We also want people living with these diseases to be well resourced as possible to live well with their disease. Crohn's and Colitis Canada has funded over $88 million in research to date. That makes us one of the largest funders of Crohn's and colitis research in the world. We have more than 65,000 supporters, many of whom are actively involved in our 80 volunteer groups or chapters across Canada, and many of whom have joined us today. So more about our patient uh, education and youth engagement programs. So today's webinar is part of Crohn's and Colitis Canada's youth engagement and education programs, which includes Camp Got to Go for children and teens with Crohn's and colitis, this, our second annual youth focus webinar series, and the AbbVie IB Scholarship Program. The AbbVie IB IBD Scholarship Program awards 10 post-secondary students living well with Crohn's and colitis, up to $5,000 to put towards their tuition. Information on 2016 scholarship will be announced shortly with applications opening early in 2006. Check out the ibdscholarship.ca website for more information. Our education materials cover a variety of medical and social and psychological issues related to Crohn's and colitis. We have brochures covering issues specific to children with Crohn's and colitis, ostomy care, medication, and many other topics. I will leave it to that for now, but if you would like to have more information about Crohn's and Colitis Canada, please visit our website at crohnsandcolitis.ca. So now I'm pleased to introduce to you our guest speakers, Dr. Gil Kaplan and Ellen Kuzeg. Dr. Kaplan is an Associate Professor in the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. Dr. Kaplan is a gastroenterologist and epidemiologist who has devoted his clinical and research career to study the environmental determinants of gastrointestinal diseases, such as inflammatory bowel diseases, also known as IBD, and improving the care of patients living with these conditions. 
he graduated with a Master's of Public Health from the Harvard, Harvard School of Public Health and completed an IBD fellowship at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He joined the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Calgary in 2007 as a, clinic, as a clinician scientist with 80% protected time for research. He was a Canadian Institutes for Health Research, also known as CIHR, new investigator and is an Alberta Innovates Health Solution Population Health Investigator. Ellen Kuzeg is a PhD student in epidemiology at the University of Calgary, where she studies genetic and environmental triggers for Crohn's disease. She was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at the age of 16 and was a winner of, of the ABD IBD scholarship in 2014. Despite struggling, overcome, despite struggling to overcome the stigma of disease, Ellen completed a Bachelor of Medical Sciences from the University of Western in Ontario. After being inspired by an, by an IBD researcher with IBD, Ellen completed a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Western. Following her master's program, Ellen turned her passion for research and better understanding of IBD into a PhD program. This is where she is supervised by Dr. Gil Kaplan. Ellen has three peer-reviewed publications and has presented her research at several international conferences. I would like to now uh, send it over to Dr. Kaplan and Ellen for the presentation. Hi, it's uh, Gil Kaplan and I'm here uh, in my office with, with Ellen. Hi everyone. Um, and Aisha, we just want to start by thanking you for introducing us and the very kind uh, words and everything and giving us the opportunity to speak today to you and everyone on, uh, on the webinar about test, tests, and more tests. Um, and I think we've got a, a really nice uh, webinar um, set up. I'm kind of taking on the, the doctor hat of talking about these tests in a more kind of clinical, technical way, but um, more importantly, Ellen's here to give her personal experience with having gone through all of these tests. Now, in the time that we have um, available to us, um, we're going to try to go through some of the tests, but not all of the tests. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the drugs that we use to treat IBD, but not in a lot of detail, just in the context of how we test um, patients based on, on, being on being on those drugs. Um, so um, what I'll do is let me pass on the I'm sorry, we're just having a little bit of a... Oh, here we go. So I'm going to pass on the presentation to Ellen to talk to her, so she can talk to you about her personal experience with Crohn's disease. So I'm, while we were putting this presentation together, I've been thinking a lot about what tests I've experienced over the last number of years. And so I'm going to take you back to 2004 when I was originally diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And um, I'm sure many of you on the webinar have had this same experience as I did uh, with sick. It took a while to go see a family doctor for a family doctor to refer me on to a gastroenterologist. And then once I had finally gone to see a gastroenterologist, the first thing he ordered was an ultrasound. And um, so one of the things that they found in that ultrasound was thickened bowel wall, which is suggestive of Crohn's disease, but isn't a complete diagnosis. So from that point, they decided that they needed to do a colonoscopy. So then why did Ellen need um, a colonoscopy? So from a gastroenterologist perspective, a, the colonoscopy really is the definitive test that we have to confirm the diagnosis of Crohn's disease when we suspect it, also to confirm the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis as well when we suspect that you may have underlying IBD. The reason why it's such an important test is that we can actually um, see the disease inside the bowel and not only see it, but we can take tissue biopsies and send it to a pathologist who can look under a microscope and confirm the diagnosis. Now, Ellen, what was your experience with the colonoscopy when you, when you had it, particularly when that first colonoscopy you had when you were diagnosed? So the first colonoscopy, I was absolutely terrified of what was going to happen. I had no idea what to expect. Um, and on top of that, my gastroenterologist wanted to do it on my first day of grade 12. And that wasn't really something that I was okay with. Um, 
and just added to the stress a lot more. So what I ended up doing was being able to talk to my gastroenterologist, and we ended up coming up with an alternative date that would still let me get the test when I needed it, but not miss the first day of grade 12. And then it's never pleasant drinking the four liters of the prep that your gastroenterologist likes you to do, but it's important that you do it well so that they can get the information that they need from the colonoscopy and you don't have to do it all over again. Um, one other thing that I'd also like to mention about that colonoscopy is I don't really remember much at all of that day. Um, and, and that's probably because of the, the drugs that we use during the colonoscopy. So as Ellen said that, you know, the day before the procedure, you drink this massive volume of laxative. Um, and it's basically a tidal wave that just pushes all of the stool outside of your colon. And that's so important for us to be able to get a really good look uh, inside the bowel. Um, the day of the procedure, um, you'd have an intravenous placed in your hand. And we use that to, to provide medications. Now, there's a number of different medications that are used. Almost um, always we use one medication um, to be a sedative to make you sleepy during the procedure. Um, but you're not out. It's not like a general anesthetic um, where you where you can't breathe. And this particularly when we do these procedures in, in adults. Sometimes with children, the pediatric gastroenterologist will do it under general anesthetic. But with typically with adult um, uh, patients and adult gastroenterologists, we use what's called conscious sedation so that you're actually asleep but still be rousable. So we can actually um, get you to interact, to roll over, to do things. Um, and in some situations, you can even see the, the inside of, of your bowel. But for the most part, we use one of the medications to make you sleepy. That medication often takes away your short-term memory. So even that we can have a conversation with you um, during the procedure even and afterwards, Many people will say that you know they have no recollection of the of the procedure, and that of course differs between different people. The other medication we use is basically to take pain away, um, and then what we do is we insert the camera. And um, we can see right here that um, this is the colonoscope it goes into the rectum through the sigmoid colon, up the descending colon, across the transverse colon, down the ascending colon into the cecum through the ileocecal valve, which connects the small bowel that we call the terminal ileum. And often we'll see Crohn's disease here in the terminal ileum or um, in different parts of the colon. Now what I've done is I actually have a video here um, that I'm going to play that just shows you what a normal colonoscopy looks like. So right where we're starting here is actually here in the terminal ileum, the small bowel. Um, and you'll see these finger-like projections, almost like kind of like a shag carpet. That's your villa. That's the um, surface area of your bowel that absorbs nutrients and water. Um, to, to um, make you feel uh, healthy. Now, as we come out of the small bowel, we're actually into the cecum now. And right there, you can see um, the base of the appendix. Um, and we're now kind of, you'll see that the colonoscopy is starting to move backwards from uh, the cecum. Um, and now we're going to be, so so now we're here in the cecum and ascending colon. Now, one of the things to notice is that everything we see is magnified. So everything is much, much bigger um, than, um, than you would normally see, and that helps us identify very subtle lesions. Now that ileocecal valve, um, it is the connection between the large and the small valve. Um, now we're going back through the ascending colon, um, and you can see a normal healthy valve is shiny. Um, you can see blood vessels course through, through it, um, and you won't see any inflammation. So I'll show you a picture of a valve that's inflamed here in a, in a moment. Um, the terminology that you're seeing on the video is just the, the anatomy of, of the different parts of the valve, but it's actually not that important. Um, we're now moving towards the transverse colon. We know that we're in the transverse colon because it starts to look like triangles, um, and we start to um, uh, come back. Now, one of the things that we can do here during the colonoscopy is actually take biopsies. Now, I'm not, there's no picture of a biopsy in the video, but what we can do is actually thread a catheter through the scope uh, and if we see something that's abnormal, like a site of inflammation, we can take biopsies and send them to the pathologist um, uh, to, to see what's happening to the tissue under a microscope. Now, we're moving along uh, quite quickly, and now we're moving down the descending colon, and we're moving into the sigmoid colon. Now, when we get to the sigmoid colon, sometimes as you get older, you'll get these pockets called diverticuli or diverticulosis. It's not really relevant for IBD, but it, um, it's it's something that we commonly see, and you'll see 
picture of diverticulosis right here. Um, and then in the end, um, we start coming to the rectum, and, and the rectum is the very bottom end. If you have ulcerative colitis, ulcerative colitis almost always affects the rectum, and in some people it moves beyond the rectum to other parts of the, of the colon. Um, and um, here what you're going to see is the camera turned around on itself here in a moment um, because we're able to look at just at the base of the anus connecting to the rectum. So what you're seeing here in this um, video is uh, pictures of what a normal healthy bowel looks like. Of course, when you look at the picture I just showed you, this is what ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis looks like. Very, very different from um, what, you, what I just showed you, and you can really appreciate um, uh, why you experience abdominal pain, diarrhea, bleeding when your bowel looks this sick. Now, we can take biopsies of this, and we send those biopsies to the pathologist. The pathologist looks under the microscope and confirms the diagnosis of Crohn's disease, and that now allows us to say, you've got Crohn's disease or you have ulcerative colitis, and we can start to treat you um, for your disease. So, Ellen, after you were diagnosed with Crohn's disease, what, were, what was your treatment? So, after I had... Uh, my first colonoscopy, my doctor started me on amuran, and which is a drug that suppresses your immune system and is really quite a powerful tool to treating um, Crohn's disease. Unfortunately, I developed um, side effects to amuran and couldn't take it anymore. So then we switched over to methotrexate. During both of these different medications. I had to get a lot of blood work done. Um, there was a lot of different tests and things that they wanted to monitor in my blood. Um, and, you know, when we start thinking about why do we have to do all of these um, tests for, for Ellen, um, it's really important to monitor the safety of medications. Every medications are associated with some potential risk, some side effects or adverse events, um, and many of these don't necessarily present as symptoms that you might experience. They actually present as things that will happen to you um, in, your, in your blood. So often we will take blood tests. We, we, we specifically are highlighting immunoid and methotrexate because often when you're on these drugs, sometimes your doctor asks you to have a blood test done every month, which seems kind of frequent, but the reason that we do that is because we're just monitoring that your body is healthy and two of the areas that we often monitor um, are your liver and your kidneys, um, just because sometimes drugs can influence um, your, your liver and your kidneys. And, and if their liver and kidneys aren't working, you sometimes don't metabolize the drug very well. Um, now, the other um, things that we often measure is what we call a complete blood count, or CBC, and that measures your hemoglobin, your white blood cell, and your platelets. Um, and, we will be, and both immuran and methotrexate can cause your blood counts to drop a bit. But specifically, Imuran is actually one in which you can um, get a drop in your white blood cell count. And the reason why that, that is, is that some people are actually born with a genetic defect in their ability to metabolize the drug Imuran. Um, and if you carry one of those genes, you need a lower dose of Imuran. Now, if you, need, if you carry two of these genes, so you've got one from your mom and from your dad, that both impair your ability to metabolize Imuran, you end up causing your white blood cell count to drop really, really low. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we monitor your blood counts on a regular basis when you're on a drug like Imuran. And in fact, Imuran is an example of, of a concept called pharmacogenetics. We're actually using um, uh, gene testing to help us determine how we treat uh, Crohn's disease with colitis. So we can actually test you for the, the genetic defect for your ability to metabolize the drug. Um, so. Um, so after, so what happened to you as next, uh, next okay. on? So we're going to flash forward to 2008. I was a third year undergrad student and I had a flare during December exams and it was now getting ready for finals in April. Um, but when I was studying, I couldn't stay awake. I would open a textbook and fall asleep. Um, so I'm sure most of you are students or have recently been through school, so you know that it's really tough to do well on your exams if you can't stay awake. So I went back to my doctor and told him that I was really tired, and guess what? He ordered more blood work, and I was diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia. 
Yeah, and, and it's very common that when you come in to your doctor's office and you describe symptoms, particularly ones that are outside your bowel, like for example, you're having fatigue, it's a very, very common symptom that people will um, express um, when they have Crohn's disease to me. And almost always, we will test for um, nutrient deficiencies. Um, and the first thing that we actually look for is we do that CBC and we look for your hemoglobin. So hemoglobin um, are your red blood cells that are coursing through your body and they carry oxygen. And so if you become anemic, your ability to carry oxygen is reduced and you actually get quite fatigued quite easily. And, and this here is a, a, an example of uh, normal, healthy looking red blood cells. And you can see the difference between anemic cells, which are paler, they're smaller, um, and there's fewer of them. Um, and so because of that, people get, can get quite um, anemic. And one of the reasons that that can happen is if you have a bit of inflammation, you can weep a little bit of blood and your, your hemoglobin requires iron to recreate the red blood cells. But if you're losing more blood than you are reproducing it, it sucks up a lot of your iron stores. Now we can test your iron stores with a test called a ferritin. And when that ferritin is low and you're also anemic, we call that iron deficiency anemia and we can actually um, treat that. So Ellen, what was your treatment for your iron deficiency anemia? So when my doctor did my blood test, my ferritin levels were undetectable, so I had to have a series of iron infusions. So in the middle of exams, I had to go to the hospital. At first, it was, I had six infusions total, and the first ones were every week, and it was almost an entire day spent at the hospital to get these infusions. So it was really tough to balance that aspect of it with school and studying. Absolutely. And the other thing that they would have probably checked, uh, Ellen, at the time was your vitamin B12. Um, B12 um, can sometimes be low in patients with Crohn's disease, particularly if they've had surgery to remove that terminal ileum, the small bowel that's connected to their colon. Um, and um, B12 um, levels um, often require, if they need to be replaced, shots of B12. Um, now, the intravenous iron that you receive um, we, we commonly do that, but often we'll also give people replacement of iron orally. And so sometimes we, if somebody's really profoundly iron deficient and anemic, they get our iron infusions like you had. Um, and then afterwards we, we maintain that state of, um, of iron repletion through using oral um, iron replacement. So um, after, so your iron has been replenished and, and, and then what happened to you? So. I was able to stay healthy for a few more years on methotrexate, but it didn't last forever. Um, and then in 2010, I started taking Remicade. And I don't know if you know how much you know about Remicade, so I'll give you a little bit of an overview. Um, it's an antibody against anti, or it's an antibody against TNF, which is an inflammatory. Um, molecule in your body and because it's a protein you can't take it orally so you have to get it through an IV. So um, when I was on that it was again challenging to schedule these infusions around school schedules and um, wanting to travel and those types of things. But I decided that, that was, it was worth it to be healthy. Um, but unfortunately, as with the methotrexate, it didn't last forever. And so um, this was, when I stopped working was right around the time I moved to Calgary to start my PhD. So what my gastroenterologist did was order drug levels and antibodies. So the next. Uh, question is, why did um, your gastroenterologist look for drug levels and antibodies against Remicade? And this is actually a relatively new test, something that we've been doing in studies for a number of years, um, and, I, and just in the last 12 to 24 months, it's become kind of more commonplace uh, to do these tests um, in, in our clinical practice. Um, and these are actually very valuable in helping us understand um, what to do um, with um, these biologic drugs. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to also give a little bit of a background on, on the biologics. So biologics are, are different than any of these other drugs that we've talked about, it, um, like Imuran or methotrexate or prednisone. Those are chemicals that you take and then they get absorbed and they act uh, in a certain way in your body. Biologics are proteins, they're actually antibodies, and they target a very specific molecule 
in your immune system, um, Remicade and Humira are cousins because they both target um, the molecule TNF or tumor necrosis factor. Um, now, Remicade, uh, because they're proteins, um, if you were to swallow them, the acid in your stomach would actually digest them. So that's why you have to administer them not through the GI tract. We have to bypass it. So Remicade is administered as an infusion, whereas Humira is administered as an injection. Um, now, um, the problem with um, antibodies or any protein that you take as a drug is that your body can actually generate antibodies to it. So an analogy, an analogy that I often give um, is vaccinations. So if I give you a vaccine for influenza, um, I'm giving you a, a protein of the influenza, and what we're trying to do is, is prime your immune system to remember that influenza is in your body and that it's foreign, so that a few months down the road, when you actually get the true influenza virus in you, your body will create a whole bunch of antibodies to influenza and destroy the virus. And that's great for vaccines and influenza prevention, but for a protein like Humira and Remicade, when your body generates antibodies, you actually destroy the drug. And if you destroy the drug, what can happen is you take a state where it's working really, really well, and all of a sudden it stops working for you. So we've been able to um, measure um, antibodies and drug levels for um, Remicade. Um, and I'm just going to show you kind of like a clinical type slide that often will show to medical students or, and to GI fellows and so like that. The reason why I want to show it to you is because I just want you to understand how we use these tests to change management. So one of the things that we'll, the two tests we'll do is we'll do a, a drug level. We measure that level right before um, you get your infusion replicated. And what we want to know is, do you have drug just before you're about to get your next infusion? Uh, and the answer should be that you should have some drug on board just before your next infusion. And then the second thing we test is antibodies. Do you have antibodies against the Remicade drug? So in one scenario, you can have good drug levels and no antibodies. And that's actually in a situation where Remicade's not working in the context of somebody like Ellen who was sick and having symptoms. If, you've, if you're feeling sick with the disease and you've got lots of drug and you have no antibodies, it's not working and we'll have to sit and think about why it's not working and change your management. But Sometimes what we'll find is that the drug levels are low. So when we, when we test it just before you replicate infusion, we can't detect the drug. In that situation, we then ask, are the antibodies present or are they absent? So in, when the antibodies are negative or absent, what we need to do is actually increase the dose. So we might give you more of the drug or we might reduce the interval from every eight weeks to every six weeks. But if the antibodies are there, then it means that you're basically, your body has created an immune response against Remicade and it's eating it up. And often what we'll do in a situation where it worked really well for you and then you lost its, its, its responsiveness, we then will switch to Humira. And the reason that we often will choose Humira is because they both work on the same molecule, but you won't have any antibodies to Humira when, when we switch you to that. So then the next question that we have to ask is, in, um, Ellen, in your situation, your drug levels were actually normal um, and you had no antibodies, but you were sick. Um, and so it looks like Remicade wasn't working. And, and what, what happened at that time? Why, why wasn't it working for you? So at that point, in order to figure out why it wasn't working so well, my doctor decided to do another colonoscopy. And when she did the colonoscopy, she found that the terminal ileum was very, very narrow, and she actually couldn't put the scope into it. So we had to come up with another solution of how we could potentially look at my small bowel, because the colonoscopy just wasn't going to work. And so she ordered an MRI, and from the MRI, we could see that I had a stricture. So one of the things that I wanted to chat a little bit about is why did Ellen's doctor order an MRI? Um, now, colonoscopies are tests where we can see the entire colon and we can see the small bowel attached to the colon, but we can't see much farther than 20 to 30 centimeters of that small bowel. Sometimes there's disease that's higher up in the small bowel that we can't see. Um, and also sometimes, like in Ellen's case, there is a stricture there. So we can't actually pass our scope past that to see what's happening on the other side. In that situation, we, what we need to do is investigate the small bowel. Um, and there's a number of different things that we can do to investigate the small bowel. 
most of them relate to imaging studies. And I just want to take a little bit of time just to talk to you about different types of imaging studies that are used, go through some of the positives and negatives of them, and to explain why ultimately um, Ellen's doctor chose an MRI uh, over some of these other modalities. So you can see here, I've, I've just kind of given a list of different types of imaging studies that you can do of the small bowel. Um, the first one is just x-rays, and, and you'll see that that's just a, a plain x-ray that you get. Um, often just plain x-rays of the abdomen, they show the small bowel, but they don't have a lot of resolution to it. It's very hard to, to see what's happening unless something really major dramatic is happening. So it's usually not that valuable um, to understand what's happening, particularly to detect um, uh, stricture and narrowing. So sometimes what we do is we add contrast. And what contrast is, is that we, um, for, for GI contrast, is you swallow um, a solution. And so many, some of you may have had a barium study where you've actually swallowed barium. The reason that we um, swallow barium is you can see from this image, it creates a contrast. You can really clearly see the colon here, or, this, or the small bowel here, um, as it goes along. And then all of a sudden, um, while you can differentiate from inside and outside the bowel, then all of a sudden you come here and you see this black area, and then you can just see a little bit of the contrast getting through, and then all of a sudden it comes back out there. And so this suggests that there is an obstruction in the area. And, and this is what we call a small bowel follow-through. It's where we um, you swallow barium, and then the radiologist will take a whole bunch of x-rays to kind of follow that barium down. Now, we're actually using a lot less of these small bowel follow-through barium studies nowadays, and the reason being is that it does require a lot of radiation exposure to take these images. Um, and the technology of other modalities have actually increased tremendously so that we can use certain modalities that have less radiation. So you're seeing less and less of us order these types of imaging studies. Now, the next one that I just want to talk to you briefly about is a, is a CAT scan. CAT scans are very commonly done um, in Crohn's disease um, and sometimes in ulcerative colitis. Um, in the past, we used to use CT scans all the time. In fact, many patients are feeling sick, they go to the emergency department, to get a CAT scan. And what happened was we started to realize that patients with Crohn's disease at a very young age were being exposed to a lot of CAT scans. And with each CAT scan, they would get exposed to radiation. Um, and we started realizing that that's not a great idea to keep exposing you to radiation. And so as a field, we're trying to move away from using CAT scans um, as something that we would do repeatedly. And almost always now, we're only using CAT scans in two major scenarios. One is if you're really sick going to an emergency department and we just need to know if you're having a problem like a bowel obstruction or an abscess or something, then a CAT scan is, is the right test to do because um, we have to understand in a very quick way what's happening. The other is there's a new modality called the CT enterography and it's basically a CAT scan of the small bowel, but it's designed in such a way that they try to minimize the radiation so you're getting a lot less radiation than kind of a classic CAT scan. Having said that, it's still not zero radiation so there are other modalities that we're starting to look at. Um, one of them is ultrasound. I'm actually going to not talk about ultrasound now. I'll talk to you a little bit more about it in a few slides from now. Um, and then the next one is MRI. And the big thing is that with MRIs, they've been around for a long time, but the technology has advanced in the last few years that we can get really, really good pictures of the small bowel, and there's absolutely no radiation um, exposure at all. Um, so it is, a, a, it is a very good modality. The one thing I would ask, though, it was what was your experience having gone through an MRI? So... Again, with my first colonoscopy, it was a little terrifying. So when I got to the department where they do the MRIs here in Calgary, I had to drink a couple liters of liquid. I had some kind of contrast. I'm not 100% sure exactly what it is. Um, and then you go into this machine and uh, they are definitely, was, didn't know I was claustrophobic until I had an MRI, but just kind of had to know that, knew that I had to plow through it, and if I let the claustrophobia bother me, then I would have to have it again, and I didn't want to have to do it again, so just... And and you know, the, the MRI was definitely, um, I mean, I think that's a universal statement, is that it's like you're staying in this tube and it's a very small confined area and you can't move but you have to follow instructions and it can be very um, um, anxiety provoking. But it was such an important test um, and, and why was it an important test for you in, in, at that time when you had the MRI? So um, the MRI did show that I had that stricture and because of that 
structure, my gastroenterologist and I decided that surgery would be the best option so we could remove that. And the reason why we decided for surgery was because that stricture was an accumulation of scar tissue just from being constantly inflamed and then healing and being inflamed again and then not inflamed and that perpetual cycle just leads to an accumulation of scar tissue. And so it doesn't matter what drug you throw at it, it that scar tissue is just going to be there forever unless you cut it out. So um, we had surgery, or I had surgery. <laughs> and without having that MRI, we wouldn't have known that that stricture was as bad as it was. And potentially, if we didn't know that, it could have led to an emergency surgery versus having scheduled it electively. So it, I ended up being able to schedule it around my school schedule. And then, so once the, the surgery happens, um, you know, what happens in the surgery is that the surgeon will remove the diseased bowel and reconnect healthy bowel. The problem with Crohn's disease is that we know that it comes back in many patients who've had surgery. And one of the challenges that we face, um, both as a physician as well as a patient, um, is that often it comes back in the bowel before it's, it, you develop symptoms. Um, and so you, so if you can look inside, the, somebody might feel totally well, but we look inside with a colonoscopy and you see the disease coming back. Um, and it's typically, there's a lag period, it can be upwards to a year or even longer before those symptoms come back following the inflammation coming back in, in the small bowel. And in that situation, when you have symptoms, um, it often is too late. Often the disease has actually progressed quite quite um, uh, significantly. And so the key things for us is what we try to do is try to identify that recurrence as early as possible um, inside the bowel so that we can treat it at that stage. And so what happened to you after surgery? So after surgery, my gastroenterologist and I decided to stay on the Remicade. Um, we figured that if we were cutting out the inflamed part or the scar tissue, there was no more disease left. And because they didn't have antibodies or anything like that, um, that the Remicade theoretically should have been a good choice to prevent the disease from coming back. Unfortunately, that wasn't quite the case. Um, and in order to keep track of what the disease activity was and what my bowel was looking at, my gastroenterologist ordered, you guessed it, more blood work. Um, so one of the things that we looked for in particular was CRP or C-reactive protein. And my, just on routine blood work, my, I was feeling fine, but it showed up as being elevated. And so my doctor's office called me and uh, we were able to schedule another colonoscopy to see what was going on. But why did I need that CRP test and why is CRP important? So I've actually had, a, as part of my PhD working with Dr. Kaplan, I've been able to look at CRP and look at it as a tool in um, monitoring disease activity in Crohn's disease. So CRP is a protein that's found in your blood and it's used to detect inflammation. So it's not a very specific marker of, of Crohn's-related inflammation or ulcerative colitis-related inflammation specifically. So if you had, let's say, a cold, you could potentially have a high CRP. And if that just happened to be the day that you went to get blood work, then you could potentially have a false alarm. But it is a good tool to regularly use. So this picture here is just a picture of what the protein looks like. I think it's a pretty cool looking protein. Um, and then this graph here just is one of the randomized control studies looking at Humira. And so this is week zero here. So at the time when people are in a flare and they're just about to receive the drug, and you can see right here, their CRP is high. So it's almost one. And then this shows their changes in CRP over four weeks. So in this black line here, corresponds to people receiving placebo. So you can see that there really was no change in their levels of CRP. But if you look at the people 
getting Humira, and these are all different um, doses, you can see that that CRP drops even after a week of treatment, and it stays low at, um, within the four weeks. So it's a very quick response that you can see. Um, and so what happened to you when, to your CRP when you started Humira? So when I started Humira, um, my CRP was quite elevated. And then three months after that, when I got my regular blood work done, my CRP had gone back to zero, so baseline levels. So now that I'm in remission again, how am I being followed? So here at the University of Calgary, we have a really, really cool and leading um, emphasis on point of care ultrasounds. So I go to my gastroenterologist's office just for a regular visit, just the same as you all would go. But when I go see my gastroenterologist, she's able to do an ultrasound of me right then and there. So if I were to say, I'm not feeling well, I have pain, she can take a look right there and see if there's inflamed bowel. And, and this is a picture of Dr. Carrie Novak. She's a gastroenterologist here at the University of Calgary. Um, and she's kind of a, a leader in Canada uh, in bringing point of care ultrasound or POCUS uh, to clinics. Um, and she trained with a marvelous radiologist named Dr. Stephanie Wilson here in Calgary, who does what's called contrast enhanced ultrasounds. Um, and uh, additionally, another doctor named Dr. Kathy Liu did a similar type of training. And she's actually just starting as a gastroenterologist in Edmonton. Um, and Kathy and Carrie are trying to set up a program to train gastroenterologists to learn how to use point of care ultrasound in their clinics. And the reason why we think this is important and why we're constantly trying to innovate and develop new technologies in how we um, monitor and test you for your Crohn's disease ulcerative colitis is that we realize that the testing that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is difficult, it's invasive, it affects your quality of life, it impacts on your school, on your careers, on your personal life, um, and it's just you know, it's just something that we, we try to minimize. The reason that we, we do it, and I hope that this presentation highlighted some of the, the importance of it, is is that because we do it because we need that information to make decisions. Um, and I think point of care ultrasound is a great example of how we can hopefully reduce the burden of these tests going down the road in, in the future. Um, often you'll, you might come into a clinic and saying, I'm feeling miserable, I'm feeling really bad, and, and your doctor might say, okay, well, let's do a colonoscopy to figure it out. In this situation, Dr. Novak could look in there and say, no, you know, bowel actually looks really healthy. Why don't we just kind of follow up? Maybe we don't have to put you through a colonoscopy. On the flip side of that, sometimes people come into the clinic, feel really well, but actually the Crohn's disease or their ulcerative colitis is kind of marching along. Um, and, and if you see that that's being abnormal ultrasound, you can say, okay, no, we need to do some more investigation. And so this is where I think we're going in terms of innovating the tests of, of the future for here in Canada. Um, and so we just wanted to spend uh, the last slide just summarizing. So as you, as you saw, the colonoscopy um, that Ellen had at her diagnosis was critical in confirming the diagnosis, both by us seeing it inside her bowel, but also by taking tissue samples and the pathologist confirming it. Um, and, and you kind of heard throughout the course of this presentation that Ellen's had multiple colonoscopies. And the reason why she's had more than one was that not only do we use it for diagnosis, but it also helps us to understand what's happening to your disease over time? Are you responding to therapies? Have you developed a complication that requires a surgery? All of these things are, um, are valuable information that we gain from the colonoscopy. Um, having uh, said that, um, the, um, the other thing that we do a lot of um, blood, testing work, blood testing around is safety of the drugs. Um, and sometimes these side effects can occur inside your body without you really knowing, and that's why we monitor your blood counts um, on, a, on a regular basis for many of the, the medications that we use. Um, sometimes you might experience fatigue, and again, and these are things that we can pick up in your blood work, like doing iron studies for iron deficiencies. Um, some of our, our newer generation drugs, like Remicade, we can actually measure drug levels and antibodies to understand why is a drug not working for you when it's been working for you for the last few years. Um, when um, we, we can't get everything that we need from a colonoscopy or we want to avoid having to do regular colonoscopies, often we'll do non-invasive imaging studies like MRIs or point-of-care ultrasounds 
in order for us to determine what's happening. Um, and often we'll do tests like CRP from your blood on a regular basis to um, see is your disease becoming active even before your symptoms um, develop. Um, so when you do all of these things, it, it all comes together to having good health around your IBD. And, and Ellen, do you want to add anything from your personal experience? So I know the tests, there's a lot of them, and um, it can sometimes be really challenging to schedule things around school schedule, work schedule. Everyone is really, really busy. But it's important to take the time to get these tests done. So for example, when my CRP was elevated um, after I had surgery, if I hadn't been getting regular blood work, we would never have known. And I was lucky that I, when we found out that I was met that the Crohn's was back, I was relatively healthy. I wasn't super healthy, but I could have been a lot sicker and potentially could have had much worse outcomes, but because we detected it early, I was able to switch to Humira and um, it prevented taking time off school. So it's really, it's important to be proactive and that will have um, huge ramifications on your ability to stay healthy and your quality of life, your ability to be successful in school, work, whatever you choose. So. Um we, we realized that we didn't talk about every single test that you could you could have where Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We really tried to focus on the ones that Ellen experienced over the course of the past decade. Um, and that's why we, we do want to have an opportunity to allow you to ask questions. I do realize that it's about 12 to 6 right now. And both Ellen and I are more than happy to stay past 6 o'clock um, if we have questions um, that go beyond um, the next 10 minutes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaplan and Ellen. That was a great informative presentation. We'll now move on to the Q&A and we'll open the floor um, to anyone who has questions for our speakers. Just a reminder, the question box is on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the chat box and we'll get to it. Um, so moving on to the questions, the first one, Dr. Kaplan, is for you. Um, why is it so important to prep for a colonoscopy, and why does the prep hurt so much? Okay, and so that's an excellent um, question, and I, I'm sure if Ellen described all of the preps that she's gone through over the past decade, um, she would completely agree with, with that, that question. Um, so the, the prep is um, cumbersome. There are different types of preps. Um, the one that's co commonly used in, in Canada is a, a colite prep. Often we'll try to do what's called a split prep, where we give you two liters kind of in the afternoon or evening and two liters first thing in the morning, um, just to kind of split it up a little bit. The reason why it's it's so important is because um, you, there's just a lot of stool and poop inside the colon. And the video that I showed you, it was immaculate. There was virtually no stool there. So you could see that we had a, a perfect view of the entire colon and in the small bowel. And so if there's even um, sometimes, there, the pathology that we see is very subtle and very difficult to see. And if there's solid poop or even a pool of poop that is covering a part of the bowel, um, we, we miss things. Um, and if we miss things, um, that can sometimes have impact on how we interpret the results and how we end up managing you down the road. And, and clearly, we don't want to do this on a regular basis, so we want to get it right the, the first time. Um, the, the prep itself does, it, you know, it's, it's not super comfortable. The reality is, is that it requires a lot of volume. Basically what the PrEP is is a combination of just liquid water and a laxative that basically is like a tidal wave that pushes everything um, out, of your, out of your body. And, and it's uncomfortable because if your body um, has Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, it's inflamed, it's hurt. Um, and what can happen is if you start to really stimulate it and push it forward because you're having all of this laxative, you know, your colon is in pain and, and what we're doing is we're, we're triggering that pain by causing you to, to flush out all of the laxative and, and the poop. So it is something that is um, definitely can be uh, uncomfortable, but the, re the reason that we do it is because you want to get a very good look and also because um, uh, the, the cleaner the bowel is, the safer the colonoscopy is as well. Um, if, there's a, if it's really dirty or messy, we sometimes have to stop and can't get to the end. And sometimes the risks um, of the procedure itself go up a little bit if we're trying to traverse 
uh, kind of a dirty colon. So I, I hope that answered the, the question. Uh, I think you did a great job at answering the question. Thank you. Um, just to add on to that, can a colonoscopy check the small intestine? Yeah, so if you remember the, the video that, that I showed, the very first part um, that, that we showed was actually in the small bowel. Because we take the colonoscopy, we go um, in through the, the backside, we go all the way around the colon, and then the other cecal valve is the connection between the colon and the small bowel. And we can actually get into um, the small bowel and we can look at it because that part of that small bowel where it connects to the colon called the terminal ileum is one of the most common places where Crohn's disease occurs. So we really do want to get into that area and we can see it and we usually with the traditional colonoscope we can see about 20 or 30 centimeters into the small bowel. Now we actually have two other modalities that I didn't really talk about um, that um, allows us to look at the small bowel even farther than that kind of 20 centimeters. Um, one is a test called a double balloon endoscopy and what a double balloon endoscopy is a very special um, type of colonoscope that allows you to actually kind of inch your way up through almost the entire small bowel. And so if we really needed to get into the, the middle of the small bowel, the top or from the bottom end, and it will actually allow you to go very, very far into the small bowel, but it's done in very specialized centers by specialized trained gastroenterologists, so it may not be available um, in every center. And the second thing that we can do to look at the small bowel um, when the colonoscope isn't, um, isn't, doesn't give us enough information is what's called a wireless capsule endoscopy. And that's literally, a, it almost looks like a capsule, and it carries a camera that you swallow. And you swallow it, and, and it basically goes through your GI tract over eight hours. It takes roughly 50,000 pictures, and that those pictures are then put together to create a video of your small bowel. And it gives us a really, really nice look at the inside of the small bowel. The problem is that if you have a stricture like Ellen had um, uh, a few years ago, the capsule can get stuck. So often what we'll do is for patients with Crohn's disease um, or with ulcerative colitis is that we, we give them a dissolvable capsule first. So they swallow it and we want to make sure that they, that they actually poop it out so that it passes easily within you know, 12 to 24 hours of swallowing it. Um, if it doesn't, then it will actually dissolve on itself and not cause an obstruction and it tells us we can't do a wireless capsule endoscopy in you. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Um, Ellen, I have a question for you. Um, do you have any tips for prepping for a colonoscopy? Um, that is a tough question. Um, really, just you just got to do it. Um, it's not going to be fun no matter what way you do. Having things like ginger ale and gravel on hand can definitely help. Um, there's been times where I like will take chug some of the prep and then I will chase it with ginger ale just because the aftertaste of the prep is awful. Um, and just planning to be home and knowing that you're just going to have a really, really awful day. There really is no way to make a prep easier. And, and if you have had a difficult prep, um, do speak to your gastroenterologist about it because there are different formulations. Many of us use the, the Colite prep, that four liter um, prep, um, just because um, it's very effective. It, it gives kind of the best results in terms of getting the bowel very clean. Um, but it's also very safe. Um, it doesn't cause fluid or electrolyte shifts um, where you become, could potentially become dehydrated or your electrolytes in your blood change. Um, and some of the other preps can do that. Um, but for the most part, the risk of those things are, are typically with um, older individuals who might have some kidney problems or heart problems. And so, so in, in, if you're kind of young and otherwise healthy, have no other issues aside from your IBD, um, you can talk to your doctor about, about some of these other preps where um, they, they end up requiring less of the, of the laxative. So particularly if you don't like the taste of laxative, have to drink like four liters of it. They can be um, smaller volume. One of them is called a Pico Salix prep. And again, these can be ordered. Just chat with your gastroenterologist. Sometimes, too, if you eat like if you're having the colonoscopy on a Friday, you're doing your prep on a Thursday, and on you know on Wednesday you're eating you know a huge meal like steak and potatoes and things like that. Um, it's going to be you're going to feel more uncomfortable kind of flushing that out the next day um, than if you ate something that's a bit more lighter, a bit softer. 
one thing versus like if you're comparing the Pico Cell X versus the Colite Prep, the Colite Prep is much shorter, and I like that aspect of it. So like, there's been times where I'll come in for a meeting the morning, not the day of, but the day before, and then because the prep doesn't start till the afternoon, so it makes if you're worried about the time that it takes through the prep, that's also something you can keep in mind. Those are great tips. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, another question I have from one of our attendees is, can someone with an ostomy or a J pouch still have a colonoscopy done? Yeah, so I mean, when we call it a colonoscopy, um, it, the oscopy refers to using a, a camera to investigate a part of the bowel. But colonoscopy means that we're doing that investigation inside the colon. Um, often, um, patients with Crohn's disease ulcerative colitis will sometimes have scopes that come from above, where we go through the mouth, look at the esophagus, stomach, and the small bowel connected to the stomach, and we call that an upper endoscopy, um, or you know, a gastroduodenoscopy is more, or kind of a more technical name for that. Um, it just refers to the location that we use. Um, if you have an ostomy, um, often we'll use um, a gastroscope, so a scope that's used to go into the stomach. It's smaller and shorter, so it's not as um, um, as big and long as a, as a colonoscopy um, scope is. Um, and we actually can go into the directly into the small bowel to see if there is re recurrence of the Crohn's disease um, through the ostomy. So we go, we, we use sedation, and we go right through um, the ostomy opening. Um, if you have a pouch, so what a pouch is, is that your colon has been removed, and they've used the small bowel to recreate your rectum. Uh, and we and we call that a, a pouch, and it's connected right to the anal canal. And again, we can use this gastroscope to go in. We look at the pouch, um, and then we can actually find the opening into the small bowel that's connected to the pouch, and we can look um, there. Often, those tests are actually much shorter, and the preps are are less uh, cumbersome because um, the the biggest challenge with these tests is actually going through the colon. So if you don't have a colon, it's, it's you, you need less prep and, and less time for the procedure. Thank you. Um, I have a question here for Ellen and Dr. Kaplan. Feel free to jump in if you, with your perspective. Um, so, Ellen, how do you fit regular blood work and medical appointments into your school schedule? That's a really good question. Um, being a PhD student, my schedule is a lot more flexible than if I had courses and stuff like that. Um, that being said, it's where I am here. It's a really it's about a 10 minute walk to go get blood work. And most university campuses in their student health centers have blood work centers. So if you have an hour or two hours between class, that would be a perfect time to schedule those appointments. Um, and then in terms of booking colonoscopies and stuff, if it's just for regular surveillance, aim for like try to get it during reading week or your summers off so you can, I mean, if it's, if you're really sick, there's nothing you shouldn't put it off until then, but if it's just I'm healthy, they just want to look at things just to make sure everything is going well, then I would like, try to schedule it around when you have breaks in school. Um, if there's a day that you don't have any classes, then that would be a good time to schedule them. Um, but if you can't work around any of those kinds of things, having a friend in class or reaching out to services with students with disabilities or whatever your university may call it, they have supports that are available. So if you need someone to go to class to take notes for you, um, those kinds of services are also really helpful in scheduling those kinds of things. And the one comment I would add from my perspective is that often, you know, you go see your gastroenterologist and they schedule for 15 minutes to, to see them in a follow-up visit, which is way too short to go through all of the different aspects. And so they're often kind of rushing through all of these different things, and they're kind of focused on your drugs and on your health and on your bowels and your tests. Um, and they often will forget to kind of ask you about, you know, what are you actually doing in your life and how is it impacting your life to go through all these things. So one of the key things to always do is just to kind of, you know, stop the doctor, create a pause, and just let them know what your circumstances are. Because most of them, um, you know, will have kind of routine practices in their clinic, but they will do many different things to try to bend their schedules, their processes, as much as possible to accommodate your needs. Because ultimately, I mean, we're here at your service. 
Um, so let let them know. Um, and if you if you don't speak up, they'll often forget to ask you. The second thing to to realize is that there are many different services that are provided within gastroenterology clinics as well as outside of clinics um, for patients with IBD, but they often are city specific. It's hard for me to say, oh, this is what we do in our clinic, and it, you know that might be great if you happen to to be at the University of Calgary's IBD clinic, but that might be different if you're in London or in Toronto or in Edmonton or things like that. So the best way to actually get advice on a lot of these different factors is to actually be part of Crohn's and Colitis Canada's chapters. So they've got chapters all across the country, and what unifies them is that it's a group of people all dealing with the same problems actually understand the issues that you're going through and they often are very knowledgeable about their local areas. So by being part of that local chapter um, and you know volunteering and being part of all the different organizations, you, you develop a network that you can go to and say, hey, what are your experiences? Or sharing your experience with other people and what that ends up doing is that knowledge gets transmitted to all these different patients. And those patients come back to gastroenterologists and say, hey, you know, you're you know, there's a gastroenterologist that you know is you know down the block and they're doing this. And, and then often, you know, we might not even know that that's the case, and we'll learn from you. So I would just is, is please join your CCC chapters, be involved, be organized, and um, and and network and learn from each other. And I think Ellen, you're like heavily involved in CCC. Yeah, I am very involved in CCC, and it's kind of what inspired me to move, go into research. Actually, is being having that knowledge to kind of take charge of my own disease. Um, and on the note with this, a lot of universities will have CCC clubs that are affiliated with the chapter, but it's specific for university students. So that may be another option that you can reach out to, or if they don't have something like that at your school, it might be something that you could work to develop. Thank you so much, Ellen and Dr. Kaplan, for the information and the helpful points. Um, I also want to thank everyone for their questions. If we did not get to you or if you have questions later on, please feel free to email us at info at ibdscholarship.ca and we will get back to you as soon as we can. So as we're drawing near to the end, I'd like to take this opportunity to let everyone know that we will be following up with you after the webinar via email to get feedback and any suggestions you may have for future topics. We also will be sending out a link to a recording of today's presentation, um, and this concludes today's webinar. I want to thank everyone again for being with us today and for the great questions. I especially want to thank our speakers, Dr. Kaplan and Ellen, for taking the time out of their busy schedules to share their expertise and experiences with all of us. Also, thank you to AbV for making this webinar possible and supporting us. A recording will be made available for downloading on our website at crohnsandcolitis.ca slash webinar. Again, thank you very much for joining us, and I hope we've helped answer some of your questions about living well with Crohn's and colitis. I hope everyone has a great night.